Kakama merosh, ha ilanot ni stalka, bo benetse, likat shabat ha malka, hine hi yoredet, ha dosha ha berucha, be imach malachim, seba shalom umenucha. Bohi, Bohi, Hamalka, Bohi, Bohi, Hakahala, Shalom Alechem, Malache Hashalom. The sun is receding from the treetops. Come, let us go and greet Shabbat. She descends with angels 
right to my left, legions of peace, come, come, welcome angels, welcome brides of peace. So welcome everyone and thank you, thank you for joining us today for the Jewish Women Vote. I'm Rabbi Mira Rivera, an associate rabbi and board certified chaplain at Romimu in New York City, also of Amud, the Jews of Color Torah Academy, and my pronouns are she, Asia, and Sia. So let me jump right in and let's take note of some of our housekeeping items. Housekeeping items. And housekeeping items done with only 18 days until the election. I hear the ambulances saying to the four, we Jewish women gather today to celebrate voting, one of our core responsibilities and gifts in democracy. Two notes about our, our program today. This program, first and foremost, is nonpartisan. It is about the power we exercise when we cast a ballot, not about specific candidates running for political office or political parties. Secondly, we use women expansively to include anyone who identifies with this term, cis women, trans women, femme and feminine identifying, gender, queer, and non-binary friends. I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, yes, the National Council of Jewish Women, the Jewish Women International, and Hadassah for presenting these important Jewish organizations here for co-sponsoring. This year we reach the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which was a tremendous accomplishment, but also not a complete one. While the 19th Amendment expanded voting rights substantially for women, it did not offer suffrage to every woman or address the barriers that prevented and still prevent Black, Indigenous, people of color, disabled folks, LGBTQ people, and minority language speakers from voting. We know that our democracy is at its strongest when every voice is heard, so we celebrate the centennial anniversary by pledging to work together to complete the still unfinished promise of the 19th Amendment. One way to do this is to encourage every single woman we know to vote. I'm inspired by all of you gathering today to make our voices heard, and I am inspired by all the women who will be gathering this weekend. We know firsthand the power women have when we team up to shape a better world. We begin the celebration of voting by lighting the Shabbat candles, spreading the joy and glow of memory and holding of tradition. Lighting the lights where there's darkness in the end corners. You can read along with me first in Hebrew and then in English. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kiddushan Rebim Etzvotah B'Sivanu, Dehav Likner, Shel Shabbat. Blessed are you, source of life, yod hei vav the eternal, who follows us with mitzvot and calls us to this mitzvah, commanding us, inviting us to light the candle of Shabbat. Next, I'd like to introduce Maharat Rory Pikernay. She is the executive director of the Jewish Community Relations Council of St. Louis and one of the first graduates of Yeshivat Maharat, a pioneering institution training Orthodox Jewish women to be spiritual leaders and halakhic authorities. 
Thank you, Rabbi Rivera. I'm Maharat Rory Picker niece, and my pronouns are she and hers. This Shabbat, we once again begin to read the Torah anew, and we start with the story of creation. The story of creation is, in fact, a radical story in that none of the world had to be, and yet here we are. But the world as we know it today was not the world that the Torah teaches was first spoken into being. Our greatest sages understood that God creates and humanity creates, and that our human power for life and for death rivals that of God. We know, perhaps better than any other generation, that we have access to the scientific tools to create new life. We know how to heal, and even in this moment of distance amid a pandemic we can't control, we know with complete faith that one day it will end. And it will end not because of a voice from heaven, but through our doctors and our scientists who can access and can alter the divine creation. We know how to heal, and we know how to fertilize embryos, we know how to clone cells, we know how to grow more crops than at any other time in human history. And that same potential for creation is our power for destruction. We know how to irrevocably damage our climate. We know how to eradicate a species. We can literally destroy the earth multiple times over. In the Midrash, the rabbis imagine one of the first conversations between God and Adam, a conversation that's heartbreaking in its beauty and hopefulness. The Midrash says, when the Holy One created the first human being, Adam, God took him and led him around all the trees of the Garden of Eden and said to him, Behold my works, how beautiful they are. All that I have created, I have created for you. Take care, therefore, that you do not destroy my world. For if you do, there will be no one after you to fix it. We have the power to destroy the world. The world as it exists today is the creation of humanity. And each and every day, we renew and reconstruct through our actions and our choices. And so as we prepare now to enter Shabbat, a day that the Talmud teaches us is one sixtieth of the world to come, a taste of the aspirational ideal, we pause and we reflect on what the world can be so that next week and the week after that and the week after that, we can continue in our never-ending work to realize that more perfect world. We are all creators, whether we signed up for it or not. Every day we make choices. And if we are not actively choosing to help, if we are not actively choosing to heal, if we are not actively choosing to create, then we are complicit in destruction. And there is no one who will come after us to fix it. Every one of us has a choice to make between today and November 3rd. But let me emphasize that we are going to make a choice again on November 4th and again on November 5th and every day after that. Because this world is one that we have created. It is up to us to care for it. And no one is coming to fix it for us. And none of us get to sit it out. So let's enjoy this moment of Shabbat. Let's taste the world to come 
let's vote our ideals, and then let's continue in our never ending work to realize that more perfect world according to each of our visions of what that perfection can be. And now, it is my privilege to introduce Deborah Messing, who is an actress known for her work in Will and Grace, The Starter Wife and Smash, host of the Dissenters podcast, and co-founder of I Am a Voter. In conversation with Jacqueline Friedman, author of several books, including Unscrewed and co-editor of most recently, Believe Me, Deborah. How Great. Trusting Women Can Change Excellent. the World. Okay. Thank you so much. And we are so excited to be here with you all for such an important issue, um, voting, what's more important than that. Um, but also, I'm, I'm hoping that in such a difficult year that we're also able to bring you some hope and joy at the same time. So Deborah, I'm thrilled to get a chance to talk to you. I've been a fan forever. Thank I won't so much. fangirl any longer, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's really nice to see you. I'm thrilled um, to be talking with you. Yeah. So let's start, let's start personal. What's your earliest memory of voting? Um, you know, I don't have a clear memory of my parents actually going to vote. I grew up in Rhode Island in the woods next to a farm. Um, but voting became very, very um, present for me when my brother, my older brother at 19, decided he wanted to run for state representative against a 41-year-old incumbent. That's amazing. Yes, he had just learned about JFK and he decided he was going to be the first Jewish president. And so, so we as a family um, made a campaign and I went door to door with my brother, knocked on doors and he would talk with them and give brochures and we had coffees in our living room and he would talk about what's important to him and how he wanted to help people in Rhode Island. And, I will never forget election night and he lost by 500 votes. Wow. And, and we were despondent. It was crushing. Um, I mean, of course, in retrospect, the, the idea that a 19 year old, a sophomore at Brown University was going to get <laughs> be state representative was kind of crazy. Honestly, that he got that close is pretty impressive. Yeah. Yes, but I think what I, what I learned was that civic engagement was um, a responsibility um, and that the way that, that if you want to enact change, your greatest power is your vote. Yeah. I mean, think about if just 500 people more had showed up, right? Exactly. Have there been women in your life, especially who affected your attitudes toward voting? Um, Honestly, I, I, I think that everything for me changed in 2016. Um, and when my, my best friend, Mandana Dayani, uh, who is Jewish and was a religious refugee, um, came to our country at six through Hyas, um, that's when we decided to create the nonpartisan um, voting organization, I Am A Voter. And um, I think it was when I learned that 31% of all young voters did not vote in 2016. And um, I think it was 59% of all Americans who were, who were registered did not vote. That was when it, it, it was like my world exploded. You know, I had gone through life assuming that everybody voted and that you know it was just the will of the people and that democracy is beautiful but then when i found out that so many people were not engaging um that really it, it was disturbing to me and it was heartbreaking to me and um so now i i feel like i'm um i have a i have a, a purpose right now to to try and get people to to embrace their power you know, because we all know in America, unfortunately, we're not all equal yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to the vote, when you walk into that 
that um, election room and you pull the, you know, you do whatever you do, you are equal in America. Every vote is equal. But do you think that everybody has equal access to that ballot box who's, who's eligible? Sadly, absolutely not. I think that it is because this kind of thing happens that people are um, apathetic when it comes to voting. I think people feel like it's not fair. And um, so why should I participate? I think that's so important. I think that so often when we talk about voter non-participation, people think, oh, people are just lazy. They don't care. They're not smart, right? They're not engaged because they just don't care. But I think that there's actually an enormous number of people who do care very much, but have either experienced the government doing more harm than good in their lives or just don't see it as something where they expect their vote to literally be counted. Um, and, and sometimes that's on purpose, right? And so yes. what, what are you doing at I Am A Voter and what can everyone watching do? What can all of us do to, you know, I think those are the real swing voters, right? This mythical swing voter that's choosing between yeah. candidates at this moment, right? Uh, I think there are very few of those people, but I think there are a lot of people who are choosing between, am I gonna bother to vote or not? Yes. And so like, how do we validate like your concerns are real right historically that's real and also like what's the argument for like why you should vote now well i i think that's the conversation that we have to have i think that 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 we have to acknowledge that um that not everybody in in our country wants everybody to vote and i think that's step one is to acknowledge that and then to say but you know what? We have a system and we have a constitution that says that you have the right to vote. And, um, and what we at I'm a Voter have, have been trying to do is to excite people about the process and also to educate people that voting, voting not only for the top ticket, but down ballot mm -hmm. has a direct just a, a effect on your life in your small community. It, it's those races that decide whether or not your roads get repaved, whether or not, you know, that you, we have better schools, whether or not there's an extra hospital in a rural community. Or also, who the prosecutor is or who's on the Supreme Court in your state. Yeah. Right. All of that is vitally important. And, and I mean, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And um, so it's been an extraordinary education for me. And so what, what we have done is we have put together a platform to make things easy for voters. So what we did was we said, text the word voter to the number 26797. And if you do, you'll get a little text back and you can get registered. And if you're already registered, you can check that you're still registered. And if you're registered, you can find out where your polling places are, where your drop box is, what the date is for your absentee ballot is due. All of the questions that can feel really overwhelming to people, we're just trying to make it one-stop shopping in one place and say, you know what, you can do this. And then it's, it's really about just telling people that November 3rd is not election day. We're right now, it's election season. Right I already now, voted, yeah. I've already voted too. It's, it, the election is now. And, um, and so there's all these opportunities, all these different options to vote. And so all we do is to, is to say, please make a plan. Because what we've learned is if you make a plan and if you take on the identity of I am a voter versus I'm going to vote, we have learned in the data that that it will make you a lifelong voter. That's so cool. You know, I was raised like, absolutely, I am a voter, right? It never occurred to me yeah. to not vote. And that's absolutely been my experience, but I didn't know that was right there in the research. Yeah. I, I also have to give a shout out to your Instagram presence. Um, <laughs> the, they're amazing, like it's a lot, all kinds of celebrities and people you might look up to are using the I am a voter hashtag. Lizzo did one the other day that was amazing. Yes. yes. <laughs> and, uh, 
and so I, I see you, I, I see you, I want to say, I see you and I see you reaching across Thanks. generations too. Um, it's been really exciting. You know, and, and, um, and, and that's what we want people to feel is that, you know, we're all Americans. We, you know, there's, there's been this, this feeling of divisiveness the last few years that has been painful for all of us. And I think what we're trying to do is to say, we don't want to break people up into factions. We want people to just be proud Americans and to participate. Yeah. And, and to know how good you will feel after you do it. And then it's just a matter of making it, you know, making it easier for people. So, you know, as you said on my, on my Instagram, I, I post, you know, uh, websites where you can find out the positions of every single candidate in your small district, you know, to help you understand what am I voting for? What do I believe in? And I, I think that once you have information, it's empowering. Absolutely. And that seems to me like a really Jewish value as well, right? Absolutely. Education is empowering and education is, is the key to our power. And as much as I totally co-signed, we're all Americans and, and this unity message, we're also here today as Jewish women specifically. Yeah. For me, voting feels really Jewish because it feels like such a part of Tikkun Olam, such a base part of it. And, but also my, as, a, as a lifelong activist, my Jewish touchstone has always been the teaching from the Pirkei Avot. It is not yours to, d to complete the work, but neither is it yours to desist from it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that people sometimes get cynical about voting because it's not going to fix everything, right? It's right. not radical enough or, you know, it's what's it going to change? But, but I really feel Jewish about this is a thing I can do. And I'm, it's not on me to do everything, but I'm not free to desist. And I'm definitely not free to give up my power to take action for social justice. So do you relate to, to voting from a Jewish place? I do. You know, my, my father was president of the, um, the Jewish Federation of Rhode Island. My mother was vice president of the business and professional women. Of, um, she went to nationals. My father was president of the, of the temple. You know, I have a, a very strong Jewish identity. And, and for me, what is the thread throughout all of, the, all of it is, is justice and equality. Um, I, I, I think that because we experienced genocide with the Holocaust, we, I was taught by my parents that it is my obligation to have children to help replenish the people that we've lost, but also to make sure that we never forget. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think the thing that, that feels so urgent to me is to look around and to see the rise of anti-Semitism, um, you know, with Charlottesville and, and seeing Nazis walking through the streets with torches saying, Jews will not replace us. I never, I never in my lifetime ever imagined that, that I would witness something like that or that, or that anything like that could happen in our country post-World War II. And, um, and, and so now it feels like as a Jew, it's my responsibility to vote for people who say, no, hate cannot be endorsed. And to say that um, I stand with people who are considered others. You know, I grew up in Rhode Island. I was one of three Jews. I had a swastika painted on my grandfather's car in my driveway when I was a little girl and it, it changed me. And I grew up feeling like an other. And I think because of that, you know, I really have deep, deep compassion and identify with people who are African-American, people who are um, indigenous, people who are um, differently abled, every, people of color, everybody, uh, Muslims, people who are, are attacked because they are not white and Christian. And, um, and so I feel like regardless of what's happening with us as Jews, um, it is a Jewish 
value that we stand up for people who are being um, persecuted. And, um, and, and right now, it, it feels like more than ever in, in my lifetime, uh, voting will have a direct impact on, on the direction of our country. And, and for me, um, you know, I, I, I just, I, I don't want my son growing up in a place where he feels like he's not safe because he's Jewish. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that makes me want to talk to you about a guest you recently had on your amazing podcast, The Dissenters. So powerful. You recently talked to Dr. Edith Eva Eager, who's a clinical psychologist and a 93-year-old Holocaust survivor. Yeah. Um, she talked so movingly about uh, what it felt like as a child who was ripped from her mother by literally Dr. Mengele, uh, and watching children being ripped from their parents at the border and, and everything that brought up for her. I mean, it couldn't be more present, all of these things. Yeah. How did that conversation impact the way you think about our obligations to and in democracy and what it means to be American and, and what it means to be Jewish in this moment when we do see anti-Semitism on the rise in a way that like, I agree, I never thought we would see, you know, I grew up um, probably like you in, you know, in Hebrew school, we learned about the Holocaust over and over again. And everyone always said, never again, never again. And I, as a kid thought, well, duh, like clearly, clearly humanity has learned that this was bad. <laughs> Why do you have to say that to me so many times? I know, I know, I felt the same way. But now, like in, in recent years, I felt like, oh, that's why, right? Like, because yeah. we need to be able to recognize it when we see it and because our elders knew that it, it could and would happen again. And, and we've learned that we can't take it, our, our freedom for granted. Yeah. I think that's, that's the, the, the lesson that I've learned in the last few years. Um, but talking with Dr. Egger, I, I mean, you know, it was very, very important to Mandana and I to, to have a Holocaust survivor on, on our podcast. Um, someone who has lived it, who has witnessed it, um, because we learned that right now, two thirds of millennials in America when asked what Auschwitz is, don't know. And just for everybody watching, the millennials are not 20. They're like in their mid thirties, right? They're These are not kids. Mid -30s. Yeah. And they don't know what Auschwitz is. To me, that just felt like we have, we failed. And you know, there, there is no requirement to teach about the Holocaust in schools. And, and, um, so to hear her story at 16, you know, to, to go and um, for Dr. Mengele to take her mother and say, your mother's just going to go take a shower. You'll see her in a few minutes. And then someone next to her pointing to the fire and saying, your mother's being burned right now. We should start talking in past tense. I mean, it, you know, to, to hear that story from this woman, but then to hear her, how she survived and how she, she looked to America as a beacon of hope and how she got here and how she was able to build a family and go to school and get her doctorate. And, you know, and, and she is this incredibly accomplished person who out of this pain decided to become a healer. Um, it, it, there are so many lessons to be learned from her but I do think the most, the most painful moment in the entire interview was when she talked about seeing the children at the border being taken from their, their parents um, and, and just how that, that gave her nightmares, you know, horrible, horrible nightmares because it was an, an exact mirror for her to her experience at Auschwitz. And, and to hear that, to think, oh my gosh, it, in our country right now, there are, there are people doing that. And we are not 
standing up and saying, no, this, this is a crime against humanity. We, we are better than this. Um, I, I think that it's, it scared me because I always thought, oh, well, if that happened in my country, I wouldn't stand by. Right. You know, where were all the, where were all the people in, in, you know, during World War II? Why weren't they saying stop, stop? And I was like, oh, I would do that. And, and then for it to be happening and to be trying to, to speak out about the cruelty and, um, and for it not to land anywhere meaningful has been a wake up call for me that really our vote is, is the way that we can protect children. It's the way that we can protect families. It's the way that we can protect Jews, Muslims, Black, Asian American, LGBTQ. Um, and, uh, and ultimately, I, I feel empowered. As, as scared as I've been, I feel great hope because we do have this power and it's just a matter of, of recognizing it and taking hold of it. Let's talk about that hope. Mm -hmm. um, we have suffered some losses of civil rights heroes yeah. uh, recently, Congressman John Lewis, Reverend C.T. Vivian, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right? Who or what is giving you hope? Who are you looking to maybe in the, the next generation of youth movement leaders or, you know, folks of any age who are giving you that hope that we're going to, we're going to prevail? Uh, well, definitely the youth uh, of the world gives me great hope. I do think because the, our, our kids have experienced so much trauma um, that that they have been galvanized. You know, they see all, they see the West Coast on fire. They see all the hurricanes, they see COVID. You know, they, they, they feel an urgency. And so that's not stopping them. And so that gives me hope. Every generation, you know, there's always going to be people who are going to rise to the top and lead. And, and what I tell people who are, are scared about the word activist, um, I say just help the helpers. Just follow, every leader needs followers. And, and I feel like literally, if, if they're gonna stick their neck outs like that, the least we can do is show up and vote, right? Like it's not, we can make a plan and vote, right? If, if yeah. they're able to do all of that stuff. Yes. So we're almost out of time. Um, but I want to wrap up by talking about action and what all of us, everyone who's with us right now can do. Yeah. What recommendations or suggestions do you have for people on the call, not only for them to make a plan to vote, which we've talked about, and hopefully yes. everyone, if you haven't done it already, is going to do immediately. Yes, yes. But also to energize and get the people in their lives and their communities out to vote. How can we each one teach one? I, I think the very first thing we do is we check in with our loved ones and our best friends and our neighbors and say, are you registered? Do you have a plan? And look and turn to your community, look in your temple and say, is there anyone who needs a ride to the polls? Are there any elderly people who don't drive or are scared to drive and say, I will drive you to the polls? I mean, there are little things. I mean, right now we have, we have 19 days. Um, you can sign up to be a poll worker. You know, they, they need them all over the country just to be there because some polls stations are being shut down because they don't have enough poll workers. And obviously when they're shut down, that means that people are not gonna be able to vote easily in that particular community. So you can, you can sign up to be a poll worker, you can sign up to text bank, which I love because you can sit on your couch and no one has to see you. And, you know, and you just sit on your computer and they give you, they give you all of the things and all you're doing is calling people and saying, hey, you know, are you registered? If not, I can help you. Do, do you know, do you need to know where your polling place is? I can help you with that. And it feels good. And you can um, text bank and phone bank, you know, there, there are things, I mean, I, my son and I have been writing postcards. I've been writing postcards all week. I've been watching TV and at night and just like writing postcards to voters. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, I, and I think that's, that's the, the, the great thing is that there's always something that we can do. And I think that that is very much a Jewish thing. You know, we, we have chutzpah. Yes. You know, and, and we don't give up and, um, and, and hope, the, 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 for me, hope equals action. Perfect. I feel the most hopeful when I'm taking action towards good. I think that's so important that it really does feel good, right? It, when, if, you're, if people are feeling panicked or overwhelmed, yeah. taking even a small action can make you feel better. Absolutely. Absolutely. When I'm feeling most nervous or anxious or, uh, you know, I, I just, I have to look outside of myself and say, who needs help? And I don't, uh, I'm not an expert at anything, you know, when it comes to activism, but I, I do know what, what I care about. And there are so many activists like yourself um, who you can follow and you can say, hey, I'm, I'm here to help. What do you need? And, um, and then what ends up happening is you find your people. Yes. You find your people. You find people who have the same value systems as you. And then you, you buoy each other and you, you feel a sense of community. And I think that's also very, very important to Jews. Well, Deborah Melsing, this has been a complete pleasure and an honor. And I hope that in a few weeks we can get together, whether privately or publicly, and celebrate an absolutely massive record voter turnout. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. We, we have to be just the, the biggest of all time. That's, that's our goal, is that the most in history. Yes, and thanks to everyone for being here uh, and everyone who's hosted and put together this event. Uh, we'll see you at the polls. Thank you so much. Stay safe, everybody. What an inspiring and exciting conversation. Thank you so much, Deborah and Jacqueline. I'm Rabbi Isama Goldstein Stoll, Senior Jewish Educator at Yale Hillel, and I use she, her pronouns. And I'm author and activist, Abby Stein, and an ordained rabbi, and I also use she, her pronouns. We all know that voting is important, but we have to remember how hard the generations before us and those working today have fought and continue to fight for our right to cast our ballots. Many of you I see have already voted or have made your voting plan, but we wanna talk through this process together to make sure that you have all the tools you need, both for your own participation in this essential democratic right and so that you can help those in your community as well. So here are five things to know to get ready for the election. Okay. Make a plan for voting, a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C. A voting plan involves knowing when and how you will vote, what time, where, and how. Take five minutes to get clear on your logistics and to make sure you know how else you might vote if you were not able to make plan A happen. What other times could you vote? What, what other options do you have? What happens if you're not able to get that bride, to get that childcare? And what might a plan C look like? Number two, if you're voting remotely, here's what you need to know. If you've requested a mail-in ballot, but are still trying to decide what to do, here's, here's the plan. First, check your state's mail-in ballot requirements carefully before you fill it out. Read the instructions on your ballot. This is super important, so I'm gonna repeat it. Read the instructions on your ballot. Some states require you use a black pen some states have requirements about how you have to seal the envelope, whether there are witnesses, if you need to include an ID, and where you can drop off your ballot. If you haven't mailed in your ballot, you should do so as soon as humanly possible. Given the complications with the USPS, this should be no later than this coming Tuesday. Another possibility is to drop 
at drop it off at, uh, at an official secure ballot drop box. Your city and county should have listings of all the kosher ones in your area. Okay, let's talk about if you're planning to vote in person. If possible, vote early. But know that because of physical distancing and other constraints because of COVID, the wait might be a bit, a bit longer than usual. Know your rights. If you make a mistake on your ballot, ask for a new one. If the machines are down at your polling place, ask for a paper ballot. Also want to add, look up the laws in your state if you are allowed to post a selfie or a picture of your ballot. And that could get important, specifically if you want to encourage other people to vote. But in many states, like in New York, that is illegal and in some cases might invalidate your ballot. Whether you vote in person or remotely, the sooner, the sooner you can vote, the better. And the sooner you mail or drop off your ballot, the better. Be aware of voter suppression. Election day is a time when a lot of voter suppression happens. This is a time when you can be helpful in helping to fight for people's right to participate in our democracy. Know that everyone who is already in line to vote on election day by the time the polls close is legally entitled to vote. Spread the word, tell people to stay in line. If you personally witness voter suppression, ask the person impacted to stay put and call the election protection hotline. Save the number in your phone so that you have it handy if you need it. Let's go to point number five. How do we help protect democracy? If you're able to show up as a poll worker or a poll observer, that's especially critical this year when so many people who typically fit those roles are at a higher risk category when it comes to COVID, so they might not be there. There are other ways you can help as well. Bring a pizza and some water to people waiting in line, specifically in places where there are long lines. Offer to help others with making their voter plan by offering a ride or helping out with childcare. We should all pitch in in every way we can for democracy. Let's all commit to vote now, okay? Please repeat after me, even if you're on mute, and then you can put your answers in the chat box. I, state your name, am a voter who will vote by, tell us how. Great work. Now, I'm pleased to introduce educator Rabbi Lori Kaufman. Thank you so much for that. Um, I am Rabbi Lori Kaufman, and my plan, I live in Manhattan, is to vote early. And early voting in Manhattan is October 24th to November 1st. One of the things one of the things that I love so much about Judaism and about our tradition is the ability to um, sanctify time. And um, one of the ways we do this is through blessing practices. So I'm going to invite us all now to uh, say a blessing for voting. The blessing goes as follows. Please feel free to join me if you would like. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melch HaOlam, Shemitzta Peh Me'itanu La'asok B'divrei, Ba'avodat Ezrachut HaMedina. Blessed are you, God, sovereign of all, who expects us to engage in the work of citizenship in our country. I invite us to say this not just together now, but to actually take it with you into the voting booth and to say this blessing as you are voting, to take the time to realize that voting is not just an act that is a civic act, 
It's actually an act that is very Jewish. It's holy. It's the way that we actually help make a difference in this world. It's the way that we actually can change the world. It's the way that as Maharat Rory Pekrini said, we can be part of creation. It's the way we can be part, as Deborah Messing said, Messing said, of uh, being part of justice and equity. So um, this voting blessing is one that reminds us that by voting, we can make the world a better place. I'd now like to introduce Rabbi Sandra Lawson, Associate Chaplain for Jewish Life at Ilan University, who will lead Kiddush and close us out. Don't you love technology, how it always works when you <laughs> want it to? Hi, um, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm just really um, amazed and blessed to be in the same space with all of these amazing people. And um, it is my pleasure to offer uh, Kiddush and um, a blessing. And um, I just want to give just a, a little brief kavanah um, about what it means for me as a Black woman to vote. Um, my parents grew up in the segregated Jim Crow South and did not have the opportunities that I have. And so I don't take voting for granted. And my wish is that you do not as well. And so with that, Allah for a blessing. Maruk. Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Borei Puri Hagafen. Blessed are you, God, creator of all the fruit of the vine. And so as we close out today, um, I'm going to write, I'm going to sing a song um, that I wrote um, well, about five years ago, witnessing oppression of a marginalized group that I did not belong to. And today I think it fits um, for us today. It's about peace. Um, and resilience.
just to stay alive and the day will come to have dignity Shabbat Shalom, everybody.